Um, we've been, been asked by the organisers to take our refreshment break now because we're running late and they're worried that the, the refreshments will be even later. So refreshments are available at the back and you've now got 15 minutes to get your refreshments and then I will be cracking the whip.
so disciplined. Uh, sorry, I always assume everyone can hear me because I'm a teacher, but this is a very big room. So, welcome back, everybody. Well done for coming back so soon. We were having a small sort of side bet as to whether I'd get you back at all. Um, this session has been adapted, as I said before the break. Uh, we're going to... Mark is going to talk about trade and the rule of law, and then uh, Veronica and Sanisha are going to talk about globalisation and the rule of law, but those topics are quite well linked, so I think the session will be coherent. And our chair for this ses session is Nana Namin Alieva. Uh, she's from Azerbaijan, she's an alumni, and she was Secretary General of ELSA International, but I can't remember the years because I'm a bit senile. <laughs> Nana, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. Uh, so this session has been adapted a little, altered a little bit, uh, as Andy already mentioned. So we will start with the first topic of our session, and that will be the uh, trade and corruption. So I will give the floor to Mark Lager, who is the partner at Deloitte uh, Legal. Mark. Uh, thank you very much, Nana. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, uh, it's the first time I attend a meeting of ELSA. I have not myself been um, a member, but I should have been, definitely. Um, I, so just briefly to my background, what do I do? I'm a competition and trade lawyer. Um, and the topic that I will talk about, and I will be brief, I only have a couple of minutes, but the topic is trade, corruption, and rule of law. And I think it is a very timely occasion to talk about trade and the rule of law, because we live in an in a interesting period um, in which the kind of global trade system uh, uh, goes through a period of fragmentation. Um, I think also we see that a more, let's say, uh, or that we're going to a multipolar uh, world, and which is kind of characterized by tensions between the U.S. on the one hand and uh, China on the other. You, you know, we see that so in the past four years or so, we have trade wars between the U.S. and China, between the U.S. and the EU. Um, so it's very, very interesting, and I think uh, we'll later talk about kind of uh, questions as to kind of whether we will have more uh, uniformity in laws, but I, I tend to think that actually kind of we will have more uh, different rules uh, or larger, higher number of, 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 of different rules in the future. And I, I just, again, I find the, found the discussion uh, today uh, very interesting, and I'm privileged to speak now uh, and not at the beginning. Um, I think uh, but also, it would be worthwhile to, to briefly summarize uh, uh, kind of what uh, the rule of law means. Um, several of the, I find, really great speakers um, touched on that, but I think no one really maybe laid it out. And uh, I think, what does it mean? I think, you know, the rule of law means a, cons or a clear set of rules that is consistently and predictably applied. And... What I found interesting in my research is that uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, for example, they um, regularly publish uh, uh, a global rule of law dashboard which ranks uh, nations, um, and, and they actually identified five criteria or five characteristics, um, and those are transparency, predictability, stability, accountability and due process. So again, transparency, which means you would want to have kind of a, a clear set of rules that is accessible and easily, easy to understand. Um, and predictability, that means that um, those rules are consistently applied and that within a stable, uh, maybe political system. Um, and of course, all actors uh, should be held accountable um, and in case of disputes, um, parties should be able to, to go to an institution which will adjudicate their claims. 
in the context of what was said earlier, I find interesting, of course, that you know that can mean many things. Uh, the law, uh, or that is kind of the the way that states express themselves, right? That's how I see it. I find it fascinating. What is the law? I think that's the only way how the state can express itself. It's the language of the state, and um, of course. Um, specific or particular kind of questions can be answered in, in various different ways. I think um, many of you might agree that, uh, you know, for whatever problem we face, there are typically a number of different ways to address those problems. And I think that maybe that for me ties into uh, the kind of the question, the rule of law or rule of justice, because I think um, you know, the question of kind of justice is, is, is highly subjective. And I think Moritz von Ende, um, you know, he said that. Um, and that, for me, means that there is an inherent paradox. And that is that, yes, it is kind of the, the, the question of kind of what is law, or what is just, that it's that is subjective. And that um, takes us to what Alma Sadic at the beginning of uh, this conference said. I think it is important for us as lawyers, as citizens, to engage in a discourse and to kind of, you know, to always be part of that discussion as to kind of how should we answer specific or how should we resolve uh, specific challenges. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, seems paradox, but I think that is the, maybe the engine also of our democratic process. Um, and because there are also, um, um, it's maybe, uh, you know, in, in philosophy, and I, I like l last night I, I looked at kind of the question of rule of law uh, and at what some philosophers say. And I think for me, um, kind of what I found um, the most convincing argument for the rule of law is that it is conducive to liberty, right? So that's what Georg, Georg Krakow uh, also said that. You know, rule of law means liberty. So I think that that is, I think, absolutely key. And of course, you have often enough uh, you know, in the discussion about kind of when the, when is when when can you when is the system not consistent with the principle of uh, the rule of law, and. Um, a former uh, constitutional judge of in South, of South Africa. I mean, he has said that it is you cannot call a, 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 a something or the rule of law if it's not consistent with human rights. But again, that's very kind of uh, subjective. Um, so, what I want to talk about now is just to how important uh, trade or trade agreements are to the to rule of law, and then I want to just talk about corruption for a minute um, and the impact that it has. Um, trade and trade agreements do have um, a very um, important uh, and positive effect on the rule of law because um, in trade agreements you typically have provisions that require uh, that, um, that, that um, countries uh, introduce the rule of law. Um, they also require good regulatory practices um, and also require measures to com combat corruption. And that is important because corruption does have a very corrosive effect on, on human rights. Um, it erodes trust in public institutions and hinders economic development. So what you see kind of when you look at it, that, that issue globally is that um, corruption, bribery and theft kind of cost developing countries some $1.2 trillion annually. So that's a big chunk of money. And um, that, that also, you know, so that, that's a, obviously a very, very significant cost. Interestingly, I think, you know, that might have also a negative effect in developed countries or it's in countries with kind of the rule of law. Um, because illegitimate funds uh, often end up um, in countries um, with which 
hold up the rule of law. And actually, why is that? It's because people who steal money from others typically don't want to be stolen. They don't want other people to steal from them or to take something from them, right? And that's why you see often that funds actually end up in assets in, um, in cities like London or New York um, because those jurisdictions uphold the rule of law and once you have an asset there, it's typically very, very difficult uh, to take it from you. And when you think of the kind of the amounts that are involved in, in, in corruption uh, globally, uh, then that becomes a problem because if you have kind of um, volumes or kind of amounts of in, in the range of a trillion dollars or so, uh, in developed countries, um, then, then, then you have to understand that this also comes with kind of power in a way, right? Um, so, because those funds try to protect themselves. And, and that means that I think the fight against corruption, in my view, is, is uh, very important. But at the same time, it does also have some paradox, again, like always, kind of uh, negative effects because you see that, for example, in trade, and I'm, I'm talking about trade, of course, that um, because uh, anti-money money laundering uh, laws have been introduced and enforced now for, for some time, you see that kind of um, illegitimate funds or, or kind of the paths of illegitimate funds move away from cash and into trades. So kind of what we now face is the challenge of trade-based money laundering. Um, what does that mean? It means that actually that money is laundered, again, not by just moving cash around, right, but by engaging in very complex um, commercial transactions, which often involve, again, global trade. Um, and those transactions are very often very difficult to understand. Um, and the kind of overall transactional kind of or the overall amount of that trade, trade based money laundering globally is estimated actually at uh, about uh, $2.2 trillion annually. Right? So, again, that's, that's something that, that um, enforcement authorities have to kind of uh, deal with. And as I said, it's very complex, very, very difficult to investigate. And that takes me kind of to my last point, and that is actually the question of uh, kind of what does that all mean for legitimate companies? Um, because they have, uh, you know, if you do business internationally, if you're exporting, uh, or if, you, if you're a financial institution, then of course you have to deal with regulations uh, which um, address such non-trade concerns, which, 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 right? So, which address money laundering, um, bribery, corruption. Um, also, uh, companies have to comply with sanctions, um, which are, of course, political tools to, um, to achieve certain political aims. Um, and also, uh, they have to deal with export control laws. That's something I do, for example. It means that um, Wojcic, I think he mentioned that, that of course there might be or is a problem that um, some um, goods that you know, are exported from the EU, for example, you know, might up in countries which might use them for purposes which are not in line with human rights. But the challenge, I think, is, and uh, also that has maybe a negative impact, or potential negative impact on the rule of law is that those rules are highly, highly complex and it uh, creates a significant burden on companies. Um, also, often uh, they're not just complex, but often or typically companies not only have to comply with the laws in one country or in kind of one region like the EU, but they might also have to comply to um, U.S. laws, for example, and nowadays even countries like China, they also um, they also introduce their kind of compliance requirements, and uh, and I think and and those that's my last point. Th those rules are sometimes in intentionally 
uh, ambiguous. And I think you could say that that might raise certain problems uh, with uh, kind of the, 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 the factor of transparency, uh, which is, of course, a main criteria for the rule of law. So, yeah, kind of that's it from, from, from me. And I, I'm very, very happy, of course, to take questions afterwards. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mark, for your speech. Um, I would like to introduce the next topic of the session, and that would be the globalization uh, and rule of law. This is perhaps a topic that creates more questions than gives answers, as it evolves so very quickly and sometimes uh, just too rapidly, and it's, uh, it becomes harder and harder to uh, define it. Um, and I think the first question is uh, really what is globalization? Is globalization the product of rule of law uh, because it creates grounds for its uh, creation uh, or, and also the environment that is created for its development? Uh, or is it the other way around and it's um, the rule of law, basically the globalization is the factor that changes the rule of law? Uh, there's an obvious and understandable um, tendency to talk in a very polarized uh, manner um, about the continued existence of legal liberal, um, global liberal order. Uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, we always have the chaos, almost the anarchy of, um, of the opposite meaning of that. And of course, rule of law stands uh, at the core of, of both of them. Um, and before and even now, there have been uh, excessively ambitious ideas um, about rule of law and what we could do with, um, with the legal, with the global liberal order, uh, where it could take us or where we could take it. And uh, even the idea is that the notion of uh, global liberal order could be taken to the step where it is, it replaces, it, it can be replaced. Uh, by the global governance, which means uh, everything would be managed and regulated from um, uh, globally, uh, and that would uh, that would also involve uh, main areas of life. And in Western and uh, mostly in the European circles, um, there were ideas that the fourth movement. Uh, with the post-Cold War era, uh, also Im involves the ideas of the movement being pushed even further, uh, meaning that it could be uh, even constitutionalized, um, the whole legal order could be constitutionalized, and it would also include uh, the international security, trades, uh, and many other aspects of life, including international courts, uh, their expansion. And now that we're at the place where we're not, we're challenged, uh, we're challenged and we think of it as of something even impossible. And maybe we should stop thinking about it that way. Maybe we should stop thinking about it in a very black and white manner and think about alternative ways of um, how we could have it, um, have something that works for all of us and not think of it in a way that we can have only all of it or none at all. And nowadays, even in the first world countries, we have a lot of uh, misunderstanding when it comes to rule of law. Uh, and we see some of acts against of rule of law as well, which forces us to also try to understand what is rule of law. And can it be altered when it's catering uh, certain interests of certain groups, uh, if that group has uh, some uh, strength or a say? Or, oh, thank you. <laughs> this helps. All right, uh, and uh, does it mean something completely different when we talk about, yeah, I think it's fine, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, and it gets a completely different meaning, I think. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, completely different meaning when we talk about some Asian countries, let's say China or Singapore, where uh, it has claimed that their governments are not often uh, democratically elected, but they also serve their populations um, in a manner that they seem to be delivering a lot of value to them. Uh, to them. And for that, they also have their own understanding of rule of law, and they also have created their own set of rules that works for them. 
so perhaps every the conclusion of my speech is that perhaps every de democracy needs to uh, keep reinventing itself. And there are specific things that countries can do to re-energize and also revamp and strengthen their democracies and rule of law. And um, yeah, we risk saying that globalization and interdependence makes it very, very difficult for countries to um, communicate and reach the point of cooperation that we talk about so, so much. Uh, that seems so far away at times. Um, but globalization probably means that you need to more uh, you need to have a more effective, more um, more responsive, and smarter governments. Um, and we should keep our governments, each one of them, accountable. Thank you. Um, for the next pitch, I would like to um, give the floor to Sinisha Rodin, who is the Justice of the European Court of Justice. You have the floor? Whatever you prefer. All right. Uh, okay. I will then introduce Veronika Bilkova, uh, who is the member of Venice Commission of the Council of Europe and also professor of international law at Charles University in Prague. Veronika? Thank you. Thank you. the table, at least. Okay. Excellencies, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and happy birthday to Elsa, to Elsa members and to Elsa alumni. Unfortunately, similarly as Mark, and I am very happy that I am not the very first one to have to admit it, I am not one of them or one of you. I think it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, I'm not so too. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not one of, uh, one of them or one of you. This is the very first ELSA event that I attend, and I am in it honored and pleased to be here. Andrew Clapham once wrote, and I quote, the fascination with the term globalization seems to stem from the fact that it means all things to all people, unquote. I would like to start my presentation by stressing that globalization does not mean all things to me. Rather, I use this term to refer to two specific phenomena which I think are very important for our debate in this panel. The first phenomenon is the interconnectedness of the world today. Not only goods and services, but also people and ideas travel in this globalized world in, on an unexpected path, in an unexpected speed through traditional channels such as trains, boats, and planes, but also through new channels, internet, social networks, etc. The second phenomenon is the redefinition of the role of the state. Globalization casts doubt on the monopoly of the state to represent its population externally in international relations. It also casts doubt on its, or casts doubts on its entitlement and its capacity to exercise effective control within its own confines, on its own territory. So the state is no longer the only solely and also the supreme master in the system, in the game. And the borders between internal and external and also between domestic law and international law become much more elusive and to some extent break down. These two phenomena could not remain without impact and without influence on the rule of law. And I think that to a large extent, even predominantly, this impact or this influence has been a positive one. And I would like to start on this positive note with three examples of this positive influence of globalization as defined previously on the rule of law. So first, globalization has facilitated 
the transformation of the rule of law from a local parochial concept into a truly global one. Actually, the rule of law is one of those ideas which have successfully traveled across borders. And nowadays, it would be really difficult to find a single state who would not preach at least a rhetorical adherence to the rule of law. In fact, for many states, the concept is much more acceptable than, for instance, democracy or human rights, which are still dirty words in some countries. The rule of law is not. So it has become truly a global ideal, at least rhetorically. So that's the first uh, positive influence. The second one, globalization has also helped produce new alternative institutions and new alternative channels. I mean, alternative to those offered traditionally by states, that means international organizations, different other institutions, NGOs, informal platforms to monitor and even sometimes to enforce the rule of law. So I think the first one to come to mind, because it has already been mentioned also a couple of times, is the European Union and its mechanism of the rule of law, its rule of law framework, all the reports, etc. But nowadays, it would be really difficult to find a single international institution and a single NGO in this field which would not do something with the rule of law, because the, the concept is so powerful, so omnipresent. So that's the second element, the second positive influence. And the third one, globalization has also forced us, and this widespread of the concept has also forced states, but also other actors, again, international institutions, NGOs, us as scholars, to think more about the content and the parameters of the role of the rule of law. So we have had, over the past couple of years, several attempts, or even numerous attempts, uh, directed at the conceptualization and operationalization of the rule of law. And I'm very proud to recall, though it has already been recalled a couple of time and, uh, times, and I'm very happy for that, that one of the most successful in this field has been the Venice Commission, with its two outcomes, its two materials on the rule of law. The 2011 report on the rule of law, which identifies six elements of the rule of law, already mentioned kindly by, by the Minister of Justice in the first session, and then the 2016 checklist on the rule of law, whose purpose is to provide concrete benchmarks through them, through which the state of the rule of law in specific countries could be measured. Now, there is, there is again this risk, which, is, which I already mentioned with respect to globalization, namely the risk that also the rule of law would become, uh, or that the, the fascination with the term rule, rule of law would also stem from the fact that it means all things to all people. And that is definitely a risk we should try to avoid. And I think the Venice Commission uh, report and uh, checklist are very useful in this, in this regard. Because actually what they do, they stress two things. The first thing is that the rule of law is not the only ideal. It's not a, a, an all-encompassing idea we have here. It's not the only normative idea and normative ideal we have either at the national level or internationally. It's the purpose of the rule of law is not to solve all the problems of the world. So we should not use it as a substitute for anything that we consider good, because there are other norms, other values, other important ideals, such as democracy, such as human rights, such as good governance, and we could continue. So the rule of law is just part of this normative landscape. And the second element, which is quite clear in these outcomes of the Venice Commission, is that the rule of law actually serves quite a specific purpose, and we should keep this in mind. And the purpose is to ensure order in any given society by preventing the two extremes, the two threats that we could have, anarchy on the one hand, and then arbitrary autocratic system or rule on the other hand. And it seeks to achieve this specific aim by setting certain uh, requirements for, first, the normative legal system. These are the principles of legality and legal certainty. Then, 
by setting also requirements for institutions or for the exercise of power. That's the principle of non-arbitrariness. And finally, by setting certain requirements for the interactions between the institutions and the legal system and people. And those are the principles of non-discrimination, access to justice, and certain human rights. It was a bit uh, a kind of a, uh, a, an added element to my presentation, but I thought that was important to stress this because otherwise we risk really asking too much from the rule of law, something that it would not be able to deliver. So overall, we can see that there have been certain positive uh, elements or certain positive developments are uh, triggered by the processes of globalization in the area of the rule of law. But obviously, there is no rose without thorns. So there are always certain dark sides. Globalization has also brought about certain risks and, challenge, and challenges. Sorry. Some of them have already been discussed by previous speakers, so I will only focus on two of them. The first one has to do with this interconnectedness. I already discussed how interconnectedness of today's world has made it possible for good ideas to travel and for well-intentioned people to align behind these good ideas. But obviously, the interconnectedness works also in the same way with respect to not so good ideas and not so well-intentioned people. They can also use these channels to spread uh, the ideas which might be uh, not so friendly towards the, the rule of law. And that is actually what we have seen in the, in the recent years with this phenomenon of the rule of law backsliding, namely the tendency of certain people in power in certain countries to try to dismantle the basic guarantees of the rule of law. And we see that they do so in coordination. So they also watch what, watch what is happening in other countries. They pay, copy and paste bad practices. We, we tend to focus on good practices, but it works with bad practices as well. And they also tend to mobilize so-called uncivil, uh, uncivil society using these modern channels of communication. So that's the other side of the coin for the interconnectedness. The second challenge, uh, and I will finish on that, relates to the second phenomenon that I used to describe globalization, namely this decrease of the power of the state and on the contrary, the, the rise, the emergence of new actors. The, the international scene and also the domestic scene has become more plural. What does it mean for the rule of law? Now, we know that the concept of the rule of law was primarily designed with the, with the state in mind. And we see it very well in the continental variations of the rule of law in France, in, in Germany, when we speak about the Rechtsstaat or l'état de droit or prava voyega sudarstvo in, in Russian. There is always the state at the core. So it was really designed uh, for the state, thinking about the state. But now when the state becomes less present in certain areas and when other actors tend to take over functions and roles which were traditionally assigned or reserved to states, this begs the question whether maybe we should use the concept of the rule of law in other contexts as well and apply it in other areas and towards other actors. And that's obviously a huge topic, so we could spend a whole conference or even a whole semester discussing that. So just very brief points on that. First, I think it's really important to have this transfer. It's really important to say that the rule of law should not remain limited to states, that it should uh, be applicable wherever we have this risk of disorder caused by anarchy or caused by arbitrary use of power. So that's the first uh, claim. The second one, we need this transfer, but this transfer cannot be done in a one model fits all manner. We can't just take the requirements for the rule of law as they are applicable to states and just apply it to other actors transnational corporations, international organizations, even individuals, because simply there is a big diversity, there is a big difference between these different, fact, uh, the, these different actors. So we need to adjust the, the rule of law concept to these specific actors. And the last point on this, 
We also cannot solve this problem through one measure or one concrete legal document. We were asked in the program to consider this idea of a global constitution, so I want to get it into my presentation. That's, that's, I, that's why I, I bring it here. So I don't think that this problem could be solved through such an instrument as a global constitution. Instead, what we need is really, really a lengthy, comprehensive, and very, detail, very detailed debate about these purposes of the rule of law, about how these purposes materialize in case of other actors and in other fields, and what would that mean for the parameters of the rule of law. Obviously, these are very complicated questions, which means that I can end on a very positive or with a very positive message that there will be interesting, theoretically stimulating, and practically relevant work in the years and maybe decades to come for the common members of ELSA and for the future members of ELSA. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, now, once again, I would like to introduce uh, Sinisha Rodin, who is the Justice of the European Court of Justice. The floor is yours. There is ELSA, there are ELSA alumni, there are ELSA seniors, and there are ELSA Methuselahs. <laughs> and I belong to this last kind, with a couple of familiar faces that I see around the hall. Uh, my background is academic, and I also decide important cases in Luxembourg. So, Andy wanted me to talk in this session and also in, in the session afterwards. And I have a great confusion in my head, and this confusion is also amplified by the fact that I have to, well, remain silent about the most juicy things, because my, my judicial position doesn't allow me. So, a disclaimer, at first, you know, all, everything I say here is a strictly personal opinion and, and expresses no institutional opinion whatsoever. So my, my, my plan, my, my original plan, I, I'll keep up to that <clears throat> to a degree, is to, to talk about three points. Um, the first one is what is the rule of law in general? The second is how is it articulated in the European Union? And uh, the third one is, what does the Court of Justice of the European Union do when it protects the rule of law? And I'll try to, to be very focused and, 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 and brief. So we've heard uh, more than once today, but that's also being pleaded at the Court of Justice in public hearings, that there is no uniform concept of the rule of law. And because there is no uniform concept of the rule of law, we cannot actually impose anything on anyone because you know you cannot impose something that is not concrete, something that is that is fluid. I disagree with this understanding. I would say, most generally, that the rule of law is a part of the fabric of liberal democracy liberal constitutionalism, and like the air that we breathe, we don't see it, but we, we cannot live without it. In the same way, liberal democracy and liberal constitutionalism cannot exist without the rule of law. So that, that, that's, that's my first general statement. So maybe, maybe some, some, some historical reference. I, I, I made a small research, I might be wrong, but the, the, the earliest reference to the rule of law can be found in the draft constitution of Massachusetts of 1779 that was presented by who became the second president of the United States, John Adams, who authored the paragraph in, 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 in the draft constitution of the Massachusetts that I will quote this, in the government of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 
the legislative, executive, and judicial power shall be placed in separate departments to the end that it might be a government of laws and not of men. Government of laws, not of men. And we should not forget about the historical context in, in which this all was happening. This was happening in the period of emancipation of, of American states that became the United States of America that were rebelling against the imperial power of, of Britain that wanted to control their territory and the lives of their citizens. So this expression, government of laws and not of men, meant actually the government of, of Americans and not of a foreign imperial power. Yet, of course, this government of Americans and American laws was not entirely democratic in the sense that we would understand it today. The laws were made by a relatively small group of, of privileged people, white, male, free. Women and, and, and slaves did not have right to vote, nor did Native Americans. So the laws that the government was supposed to be made of was actually law, were laws of, of, of a small uh, American elite. But nevertheless, the basic principles that were consecrated in, in the Constitution of Massachusetts and the Constitution of the United States later on laid the blueprint according to which all modern liberal democracies function. On constitutional level, the rule of law is inextricable from two other very broad concepts. One is counter-majoritarianism, which includes the separation of powers, but also judicial review, which, which, which controls the majority, and, and federal arrangement. But on sub-constitutional level, we should inquire ourselves what quality the laws that we make should have in order to satisfy the requirement that we today call the rule of law. Well, there is an idea which is also deeply rooted in, in, in liberal democracy, that without regulation, stronger side always wins. And that the purpose of regulation is not to favor the stronger side that will win anyway, but to make it possible for a weaker side in a relationship to compete on equal footing with the stronger ones and to be in a, an equal position or equalized position which will make it possible for the weaker side to win a day in a court. If you look into this legislative fabric of, of liberal democracy, this idea of protection of weaker side is, is pervasive. You can see it in, in, in procedural rules as a shifting of burden of proof. You can see it in competition law as prohibition of abuse of dominant position. You can see it in, in, in consumer protection law where consumers are protected as a weaker side of a civil law relationship. And also in civil law as a restrictions, different restrictions of liberty of contract. Well, this idea that we should protect by means of law a weaker side is not a coincidence. It didn't come by chance. It is a deliberate choice of architects of liberal constitutionalism to build it in 
the grand legislative and constitutional scheme. And this idea operates under certain assumptions. Remove these assumptions and it becomes very, very difficult to, 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 to well, implement it. Well, one of these assumptions is that the government is limited. And the government is limited by the social contract. And the social contract that was forged in the American War of Independence on one side or in the French Revolution on the other side of the Atlantic also is based on, 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 on certain premises. So one of these premises that the government is, is supposed to protect is property. But property, well, it, it is not irrelevant how the property is acquired. According to John Locke, one of the great liberal thinkers of that era, well, the property is acquired by extraction from nature, but it is limited by right to equality. And he devised his famous enough and as good proviso. So that the property should suffice to, to, to furnish everyone's needs and has to be of the same quality. Based on, or, or, or next to, 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 to protection of property comes protection of individual liberty. And individual liberty we have heard already today is a liberty to decide what it means to run a good life for each and every person, as long as this idea of a good life does not contravene with somebody else's right. And then, on the top of all this, comes the institutional setting because there has to be someone, there has to be someone who will protect the weaker side. And it is only logical to say that the majority cannot be that agent that will protect the weaker side because the majority will by default protect its own interests and agendas. And here comes the judiciary. The judiciary which has to be counter-majoritarian, that means independent of any present or future political majority, that will safeguard the constitutional and, and legal system in order that that system can protect the weaker side. Once the independence of the judiciary is compromised, there is no protection of the weaker side, majority wins, and legal regulation becomes meaningless. We don't have government of laws. We have, again, government of men. And that is why what we nowadays call the rule of law is so important. And that is why the rule of law is inextricably linked to independence of the judiciary. And if you, indeed you look into the case law of the Court of Justice, you will see that the vast majority of cases that we deal with, that we are confronted with, under the heading the rule of law, concern one single dimension, and that is independence of the judiciary. Well, this brings me to the second point. What does the rule of law mean in the European Union? The European Union is a liberal democratic arrangement under the treaties, not under a constitution, but under international treaties. But the member states have voluntarily entered this liberal democratic arrangement and transferred certain powers to the union. This is all consecrated in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union, which specifies union's values 
which says that the union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. And then it says further that these values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between women and men prevail. So that is the basic definition of, of values on, on, on which European Union is founded. Most generally, these values are binding on institutions of the European Union, but they are also binding on the member states. Why? Because they have accepted the founding treaties and these values. So, so the, the question may be asked, you know, is this statement that these values are common to the member states, is it a normative or, or, or a descriptive uh, statement? I would say it's both at the same time. It is descriptive, but also it is normative. So if in reality it happens not to be true, there is a normative claim that, this, that these values should be reestablished both on the level of the EU and on the level of the member states. This is also reinforced by, by the other provisions of the treaties, like duty of sincere cooperation, Article 4, Paragraph 3, the provision which says that pursuant to the principle of sincere cooperation, the Union and the member states shall, in the full mutual respect, assist each other in carrying out tasks which flow from the treaties. This also flows from Article 19 of the Treaty on European Union, which regulates or, or proclaims the, the, the role of the judicial branch and says that the court of justice of the EU shall include the court of justice and the general court and that it shall ensure that the interpretation and application of the treaties, the law is observed. This is another expression of the rule of law. However, paragraph two of the same article 19 says that the member states shall provide remedies sufficient to ensure effective legal protection in the fields covered by union law. And in the case law of the Court of Justice, starting from the famous Portuguese judges case, uh, this Article 19 is interpreted in a way that judicial independence that flows from Article 19 and the requirement of the rule of law is equally binding on European courts, but also on the national courts. Because if we don't courts, we don't have, well, well that, that's the logic uh, and my interpretation, because if you don't have independent courts, you cannot protect the weaker side. If you cannot protect the weaker side, you don't have liberal constitutionalism, and that's, that's the end. Well, so what is EU law then all about within this framework of Article 2 of the treaties and, and the rule of law proviso? At minimum, and we can talk about a minimum, it is supranational structure with horizontal and vertical separation of powers which entertains independent judicial review on European and national level which guarantees fundamental rights, liberties, and other values. In other words, that permits all individuals to define their own idea of good and pursue a good life as they mean fit, as long as they don't harm others. And also a liberal economic governance, market economy, also a reflection of long gone Locke's thoughts on property. What does this actually mean? It has been said many times from illiberal critics that European Union project is not neutral, that it favors European outcomes and disfavors some other outcomes. My 
reaction to this line of criticism is, is, is the following. Yeah, of course not. Of course that EU law is, 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 is uh, European Union is not ideologically neutral project. It is a project that favors quite clearly liberal constitutionalism and government limited by law, limited by federalism or supranationalism, and the model that protects individual rights of the weaker side. What does the court or how does the court of justice react to all this? What, what does it make of, 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 of uh, the rule of law? Well, as I said, among the cases that the court decides, vast majority of them concern independence of the judiciary in the member states. And in this respect, uh, the court has distinguished judicial independence judicial impartiality, and also, to a certain extent, judicial neutrality. And I will end up just with, with articulation of, of these three concepts. In case law of the Court of Justice, independence of the judiciary means that the body concerned, I'm, I'm quoting now, the standing case law, that the body concerned exercises its judicial functions wholly autonomously without being subject to any hierarchical constraints or subordinated to any other body and without taking orders or instructions from any source whatsoever. And that is thus protected against external interventions or pressure liable to impair the independent judgment of its members and to influence its decisions. So this is independence. Impartiality, on the other hand, can be either internal or external. Internal impartiality is that the members of the court themselves must be subjectively impartial. That is, none of its members must show bias or personal prejudice. And external, that the court must be objectively impartial, that is to say, it must offer guarantees sufficient to exclude any legitimate doubt in this respect. So the third concept, and, and that, uh, this is where, to my mind, things become interesting, is neutrality. If you, if you read case law of the Court of Justice closely, then judicial neutrality is the least discussed concept among these three, impartiality and independence and neutrality. Somehow. Judicial neutrality appears to be a function of independence and impartiality. If a court is independent and impartial, somehow it only flows naturally that it is also neutral. Why is this so? Why this appears so? It appears so because judicial neutrality operates under liberal constitutionalism. And judicial neutrality, as we know it, is present as long as the social contract of liberal constitutionalism works. Step out of the umbrella of, of liberal constitutionalism, and you will say, look, you know, they are not impartial. They are not neutral, sorry, not, not, they, are, they are not neutral. They are generating Europeanizing outcomes. Looking from within the liberal constitutionalism. There are no European or any other outcomes. There, there are just outcomes that court is delivering. But these outcomes, of course, operate under liberal constitutionalism and not under any other social or constitutional arrangement. So a final word. All this is not self-understanding or, or, or natural. As I've put it in the paper that you will find in, 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 in your, your, your booklets, neither liberal constitutionalism nor the case law of the Court of Justice are universal standards of excellence. They are nothing but traditions, tradition that we live in, 
And that tradition needs to be cultivated, needs to be cared about if we want it to persevere in the future. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, I would like to open the floor for questions. Two minutes. <laughs> Maybe one question then. Yes. Yes, Wiel Hoefnagels from Holland. In the 80s, I was in Elsa. Uh, my question is about uh, journalism and the independent media. I don't hear so much about it, but uh, for autocrats or becoming autocrats is the first thing that they attack, like Putin killed uh, Politkovskaya. Uh, what is your, I don't know who to ask to. I think. Uh, uh, Sinisa and Veronica might say something about it, or Veronica might say something about it, uh, because I think that needs protection, but how can it get more protection from the rule of law? Thank you. I think we all agree on with you that media need more, attack, more uh, protection. The question is whether the rule of law is the right instrument to ensure it. And that goes back to my previous comment that we, shouldn't, we should use concepts for the purposes they have been created for and not to try to use the concept to solve all the problems we have. So for me, the, uh, the question of the independent media would more uh, fall under the... And I have this triple structure of the Council of Europe in mind, so sorry, maybe it's, it's, it's a professional def deformation, but there is this triple structure of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And for me, the, 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 the freedom of press, the, the freedom of expression more falls under the, under the human rights. Do it's true that this is one of the areas when there is an overlap between human rights and the, the rule of law, especially if we embrace this so-called thick concept of the rule of law, where we stress that it's not enough to have certain procedures, formal issues in place, but that it's important also to have uh, certain rights respected. And then if we embrace that, then I would, I would say that the, the uh, the, 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 the protection of media would fall under that. So conceptually, we know where to put it. What to do practically, that's obviously another question, but that's a broad one, and I don't think that we could deal with it in, in 30 seconds. But I think some of the, um, of the lessons learned from the previous, uh, fr from the previous sections would, v would work here as well. That means speak about it when we can in other countries, support those who have problems from outside, through money, through symbolic acts, through uh, providing channels uh, of communication. I think that would work here as well, but it's really, uh, I, I, I can't give you a very comprehensive picture on, on that. Sorry for that. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, one of the things we talk about is uh, globalization and corruption, and I think globalization is something that the media uh, is doing very well. Some wrong media, some uh, media is attacking, I think, uh, rule of law and democracies in several places, and so I think it would be for this forum too. Thank you. I, I just have one thought. Um, and, and, and for those who, who, who uh, are interested in this topic, I, I, I can warmly recommend a, a very interesting book written by Yasha Munk, uh, People versus Democracy. Uh, on, on my part, I can say that I'm worried. And, and, and I'm worried because of one phenomenon that, that modern communication has brought about. And this phenomenon is possibility for one person, wise or, or not wise, moderate or, or, or radical, to communicate directly with, with millions of, of followers, bypassing democratic process. And just think about it. And, 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 and think about what media have become in the in, in last 10 or, or 15 years. Two minutes are up, so I'm um, guessing this is the end. Unfortunately, we do not have more time unless Andy allows for one more question from Patrick. Patrick, Patrick, Patrick. <laughs> Patrick who? <laughs> yes, of course. 
Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, thanks to you both. Uh, question primarily for Sinisha. You, you, you mentioned that uh, the, the, the cultural, uh, sorry, liberal democracies need to be cultivated. Uh, and, and I agree with that. It's not established as a rule of law. How, how, do, how do we go about doing that? What's the role for organisations like ELSA alumni? And, and I'm thinking particularly of the, the role project, which we'll hear about later, which is, which is about uh, teaching school children of young ages to, to about the values and principles of the rule of law. So just, just some thoughts on that question. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very difficult question, but if you, if you look into the meaning of the word tradition, tradition is something that results from repetitive practice. So you need to establish a practice and, and perpetuate that practice over an extended period of time. And it has to work. It has to really deliver. Uh, over an extended period of time, practice becomes tradition. And on a longer scale, it becomes culture. So I would say it, it's very naive to think that, that any culture can be just transplanted or, or, or implanted into, into any, any community. It has, to, it has to somehow grow on, on, on a community. And, and maybe the problems that we are experiencing at this moment and the reason why we have this conference with the topic rule of law, you know, is, is ex exactly expression of, of, of frustration, you know, that this process of, of cultivation and, 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 and growing of, 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 of liberal constitutionalism is not maybe taking the course uh, as fast as one would wish to. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to say thank you to the panel for their very insightful thoughts and thank you for your attention. I'm not sure. Oh. Thank you very much to the panel. Uh, I'm really sorry that we didn't have more time for that debate. I could see Veronica shaking her head, and I would have liked to have given her a right to reply. But uh, perhaps at the reception afterwards, we can pick up the, some of these themes. Um, now, in a complete change of pace, uh, Taser Priest and her colleagues are going to introduce the ELSA Rule of Law Education Programme. Project. We're ready, yes. Are we able to show the uh, Commissioner Reinders video now? There is video from DJ Reinders. Uh, it's coming now. It is such a pleasure to talk to an audience of young law students and legal professionals. As policymakers and legal professionals work to uphold the principles of the rule of law in the European Union today, your generation is responsible for carrying the torch. Your journey has in fact already begun. Learning about the importance of the rule of law is part of this. The rule of law is one of the core values of the European Union. It is the glue that binds our union together. And it is essential for the protection of all other values on which the European Union is founded. Freedom, democracy, equality, and respect for human rights. This is why I want to welcome the launch of the new project today on rule of law education. Thank you to ELSA and ELSA alumni for this important initiative. With your ambition, you can make a tangible difference in educating young Europeans about the rule of law. This comes at a point in time when respect for the rule of law cannot be taken for granted. Today, there are challenges to the rule of law in the European Union. 
Over the last few years, the Commission has developed a variety of instruments to address these challenges. We call this our rule of law toolbox. Last year, we added an important instrument to this toolbox, the annual rule of law report. In July this year, we published the second edition. It is the outcome of over 400 meetings with authorities, stakeholders, legal professionals and civil society across the European Union. The report is a central element of the Commission's efforts to promote a genuine dialogue on the rule of law, and it provides the basis for discussions on EU and national level. It was just last month that I was where you are right now, in Vienna, discussing with members of the Austrian Parliament, public representatives, as well as representatives of civil society. And we plan to visit all member states in the following months. The rule of law report aims to prevent problems from emerging or deepening. It is also a basis for member states to learn from each other by exchanging best practices. A month ago, this was the case when EU ministers met in Luxembourg for the General Affairs Council. Overall, it allows the Commission to assess the health of the rule of law across the European Union. But we also want it to help Member States improve. As President von der Leyen announced in this year's speech on the State of the European Union from 2022, our rule of law report will also come with specific recommendations for Member States. As the President said, Protecting the rule of law is not just a noble goal. It is also hard work and a constant struggle for improvement. The annual rule of law report is an important part of this process. And we should not be afraid to talk to each other when there are worrying developments. Last month, the Prime Minister of Poland, Mateusz Morawiecki, came to the European Parliament to address MEPs. This was an open forum for an honest discussion. A few weeks ago, EU leaders met together in Brussels for the European Council. They had an important discussion on the rule of law and in particular on judicial independence. As President von der Leyen said, we have a long road ahead of us. This road is a combination of dialogue, legal response and concrete action to restore the independence of the judiciary. This includes the implementation of the ECG rulings from July, and the Commission expects Poland to implement these rulings. In the European Union, dialogue always comes first, but it must lead to results. This is why we match dialogue with decisive action. In critical situations, where judicial independence in a member state is affected, the Commission can launch infringement proceedings, as it did, for example, in the case of Poland. We can also protect the EU budget against breaches of the rule of law. In the coming years, we will be investing 2.1 billion euro in European taxpayers' money for all common EU recovery. We now have a conditionality mechanism in force since 1st of January this year. And both OLAF and now the Open Public Prosecutor's Office are there to protect the budget against fraud. We also want to see national recovery plans investing in improving the rule of law. Many member states are doing this with investment in the digitalization of justice, for example, which we saw during the pandemic was extremely important. Elsewhere, as part of the European semester, the annual cycle for aligning economic and fiscal policies in the Union, the Commission has made country-specific recommendations on justice reforms in member states that were adopted by the Council. Member states are expected to address these recommendations in their national recovery plans. And lastly, 
we have the Article 7 procedure, which needs no further explanation. In short, the European Union has many tools at its disposal to defend the rule of law. But to achieve our overarching goal of building a rule of law culture, this is a responsibility of us all. Which brings me back to you, Elsa and Elsa alumni. Organizations such as yours and projects such as Role are so important in nurturing this rule of law culture. So, on this note, let me wish you a happy 40th anniversary and the best of luck for the next 40 years. I'm sorry I can't join you in person today, but I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the rule of law during today's conference. Thank you very much. We will be talking to you about the rule of law and education. First, I have the privilege to introduce Michael Abiodun Olatokun. He's the head of public and youth engagement from the Bingham Center of the Rule of Law, for the Rule of Law, human rights lawyer, non-executive director of four charities, and British Institute of International and Comparative Law Diversity Officer. Over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me. So I am not going to retread a lot of the juridical and doctrinal ground where we tried to talk about the rule of law today, and I'm absolutely not going to say the words, education is the tool we need. But what I am going to do first is remind us of exactly what is going on. We all, I assume, were able to get here we are in a relatively privileged position. We also have a much higher level of legal knowledge and ability than the average member of the public. But what's going on out there in the real world? Well, the World Justice Project tell us that 84% of the world's population live in a country that is less rule of law compliant than 12 months ago. We're told by the UN Commission on the Legal Empowerment of the Poor that four billion, that's over half the human population, four billion people are prevented from the opportunity of being able to escape poverty and improve their lives because they lack access to the legal system. Now, that's all doom and gloom. The UN, catastrophic reports, Sounds like you get one of those every other day. But another part of the UN, the Office for Drugs and Crime, produced a report that is very much resonant and very much uplifting when considering what you and Roll and everybody who's worked on the education project is working to do. They said, after having worked with over 120 experts from countries across the world, having deep interrogative conversations about the role that education can play, they said that where there are really epic rule of law education projects that engage on a local level, that inspire kids, young people and adults, that that can help to create a culture of lawfulness in the country, a culture of lawfulness that means that people are willing to hold politicians to account when they, for example, act outside of their powers, a culture of lawfulness in which there is a likelihood that people presented with a legal problem will seek formal redress through the legal system. And let's just think about what it means to be a citizen of that kind of country, as opposed to one of those countries where there's been rule of law backsliding. You have an employer who has discriminated against you and got rid of you. You can get your dignity and your job back as a result of having some legal knowledge and ability to challenge. You have an abusive spouse and there's a marital dispute. Well, you're actually able, with the uh, ability to know when there is a legal problem that has an actionable legal element, to do something about it and protect your interests and all those of your children. It might be the case that you have an abusive landlord. Again, the literal roof over your head could be the potential benefit of legal knowledge, advice, information. And that is exactly the mission that we are embarking upon today. 
I want to talk a little bit about my journey with public legal education. As a fresh-faced university graduate seven years ago, I looked around, you know, are there any jobs? Please, please give me a job. And the first one I found was running a campaign for political participation, encouraging people to register to vote, essentially. That had a very clear call to action. To be honest, it was relatively easy because five years ago in the UK, we had quite a, a big plebiscite that people wanted to register for. I think it's made Andy and I, our journeys and queues, very much more difficult than they would have been in another year. But the upshot of all of that was that the Brexit referendum provided an opportunity to get people who didn't see themselves as political to engage. And that was really easy work. In the end, I managed to get hundreds of thousands of people registered to vote through this campaign. We even got a shout out from Barack Obama about the importance of our campaign. And, you know, I'm not going to say that the, the vote itself ended in the result I wanted, but it led to many people who, again, never thought that they would have the ability to say to a politician, this is what I think, taking their first step in democracy. Now, flash forward a few years and yeah, <laughs> I have significantly more grey hairs and I'm much more stressed because now the mission is about legal empowerment, which unfortunately is a much, much, much more difficult task with less concrete aims. Did you know that democracy is important? Well, if you register to vote and take part, you can actually influence the way that decisions are made. Kids, human rights, law, um, not quite sure what you're going to do now. That's one of the challenges that I face as a rule of law educator, working with children in primary school, so people younger than 11 and those aged 11 to 18. The lack of a clear call to action, as well as the fact that there isn't much space for non-professionals to engage in developing the legal culture of their country, unfortunately. But despite that, there have been many opportunities and many avenues through which that mission of legal empowerment could happen. In the UK, we have a uh, government that thinks about law in a way that's very troubling, and I think you've heard a little bit of that in outline. We have a, an education system that has changed quite significantly over the last 10 years, and one of the things they've sought to do, and for our French attendees, this will be particularly amusing to you, that they've introduced something called fundamental British values in our schools. What are these FBVs, you say? Well, <laughs> I think Montesquieu and co could quite rightly make a copyright claim against the UK government for this. They are individual liberty, <laughs> democracy, respect and tolerance for those of a different faith, and fourthly, the rule of law. Sorry, what was that? Yes, the UK government imposed a mandate upon all schools to teach the rule of law. And you might think that for someone like me, that's literally the best thing ever. That's December 25th every day of the year. Thank you very much. Not quite, unfortunately. We've heard today especially from Wojciech and, and Veronica, this idea of legality, which can often be used as a substitute for the rule of law, which I believe to be a bigger concept than the idea that government should act in accordance with the law and not exceed those powers and that others would be similarly obliged. In China, in, in Mandarin, people talk of the concept of fa zhi, which is often loosely translated as rule by law and by the Chinese authorities as rule of law. Two very separate concepts for people who think the way that we do. However, unfortunately, in the common narrative, rule of law and rule by law are almost synonymous, where people don't have legal training. They think rule of law, all that means is you have to obey the law. And similarly, the civil servants who drafted this guidance for English schools did exactly the same thing. They said the rule of law means that you should teach everything in the English criminal and civil system, 
that people need to know in order to be within those systems and nothing that undermines it. So a rich, vivid, thick conception of the rule of law that says that we should have the, the ability and the access to be able to perhaps suggest law reform, the idea that law will develop over time incrementally through jurisprudence. These two concepts didn't seem to be compliant with this legal guidance provided by the Department for Education in England. And the point I want to make is we can't just chuck random education stuff at people and think it's going to solve our rule of law crises. I actually think that where it's not done well, it can actually result in negative outcomes. And that's why looking at the U United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, Education and Training and the Council of Europe document with a similar name, going to choke, uh, choke over my tongue again so I won't go through that one. But these two treaties essentially say that you should act in a way that is about, through and for human rights and the rule of law. I think we all know what it means to teach about something. We want the content in there that's going to tell them this is where you go when you have a legal issue. But I think as well as that, we should also tell vivid stories of how the rule of law has made a difference so that people can empathise and say, well, it really matters that I'm able to hold politicians to account. It really matters that politicians aren't exercising their decision-making powers on an arbitrary basis because of this claimant who was successful, whose life changed as a result, or this community who are able to challenge the environmental polluter, etc., etc., etc. The second aspect, through the rule of law, through human rights, I think it would be very difficult, deeply ironic, and against the principles of what we're doing if it was in a situation where, for example, students couldn't participate, where it was very didactic, where there's just the person who knows all the stuff at the front, you have to consume it, and then, yeah, they get to look great on camera whilst you're not speaking. Is that what's happening here? <laughs> but to act in a way that is through human rights and the rule of law, I think there's something about having the ability to interact, being given the opportunity to, to give your view. And one of the games that Andy and I have been trying out at South Bank this week is a game in which we have four participants. One of them is able to give their view on a wide range of public policy issues, and the rest of the three are cut off and stifled. And then that one person gets to be the privileged insider, the person who was able to put their view into the policy, the prime consultee. And the other three feel the debilitating injustice of not being able to participate in a case which you care deeply about or in which you are, you are deeply invested. And that's a sort of means of trying to show people the, the trials of injustice and the difficulty that one faces in order to get them to empathise with others. And the final bit, which I think is incredibly important, which is sadly missing from the vast majority of human rights and rule of law education programmes, is the idea that we do it for the rule of law. For the rule of law is a matter of activity. It's taking whatever you've heard, whatever you've read, and providing those who have learned it an opportunity for real life application. Because it is there that we really make a difference. Where we have young people, for example, talking to a minister and saying, I'm not quite sure that we could even read these consultation documents. Are you sure that they should be all wordy and whatnot? It's giving young people the opportunity to say, this law has deeply affected me and people like me. Can you do something about it? So opportunities to improve the rule of law culture in a country, I think, should be necessary addendum to every education programme. And TASA and others have been working really hard on an awesome curriculum that I absolutely support. And I think once it's in your hands, we'll deeply empower you to bring these rich stories of human rights and rule of law to the communities that need them 
so that when we get to the 60 or 70 or 80 year anniversary, we're not having to talk about rule of law backsliding. We're not having to talk about executive overreach. We're not having to talk about a concept that has been so overly discussed without concrete meaning that it has almost become worthless as an analytical tool. Instead, we'll be talking about how ELSA started a wave of public legal education across the world that ensured that more people benefit from a culture of lawfulness, i.e. the rule of law. Merci beaucoup. So Michael said it all. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of talk and thought today about the rule of law. No, not everybody really understands what it means. There's different ideas. But maybe worse is we cannot, many of us, have difficulties explaining this to our children or our neighbours. Before I started the role project, at least I didn't. Do you? So, it's often cerebral, academic, and this is a problem. And I'm going to read it to you because I want to be precise. It's a problem as the rule of law can only exist if everyone feels empowered, as Michael said, to challenge structures and decisions which are not in line with or do not result in fairness and justice. It's not about power to the law. It's more about power to the people. In other words, grassroots legal empowerment. In fact, more and more the rule of law is seen as indispensable to achieve climate justice and protection of human rights. The rule of law can only be maintained where individuals are given the tools and the opportunity to enforce their rights. This is exactly what the ELSA rule of law project is about. ELSA alumni initiated this project two years ago, aiming on the long term um, to teach in interactive lessons secondary school students between 12 and 17 year, years um, some material, but moreover, internalize questions like this. What are the social structures required to engender fair and just behaviors around me? Do I see injustice in my community? And what can I do about it? What do others do about it? What can I do if I feel my government or a multinational does not adhere to the rules or the rule of law? How can I protect my rights, taking into account justified interests of others? ELSA members, law students and young lawyers will teach the mother curriculum localized and translated in secondary schools throughout Europe, giving youth, our youth, the knowledge, skills, dispositions and confidence to engage on and advocate for improved rule of law in their communities. Specifically, the following outcomes will be measured. Students have an increased understanding of the rule of law concepts and their relation to the health of democracy. Students can analyze strengths and weaknesses of the rule of law in their country. They can describe how rule of law may be experienced different, differently by individuals from different backgrounds. Ethnicity, race, race gender, socioeconomic class, etc. Students can identify a rule of law challenge in their community and formula formulate a plan for addressing the challenge. Students have improved civic attitudes that support rule of law concepts and, as an aside, students have a more comprehensive understanding and the purpose of legal education and professionals. Now, Francesca, Francesco Argai Lima will tell you how this project is implemented by ELSA. Francesco is the current president of ELSA, um, also studying PhD in law, uh, former president of ELSA Portugal, and general secretary of the John H. Jackson Moot, Moot Court competition. Over to you. This is right. So, this is working, right? Yeah. Yes. So, hello everyone. 
Um, I would just start by making two uh, remarks. First, I'll keep myself short and simple. I don't know how it was in most of your time, but right now there's the stereotype that presidents like to hear themselves talk. So I will start off by breaking that stereotype and uh, going straight to the point. The second one is um, I will not talk about rule of law. I'll talk about Elsa because that's actually what I can talk about. Uh, and I'll talk about precisely the role campaign, rule of law um, education campaign, because since we're talking about rule of law uh, during our 40 years anniversary, it would be quite unfortunate for us not to be doing anything regarding the topic. So before delving into the, um, the actual structure of the, the program, um, let's well, I want to talk about why we started it, why we have the, um, the role campaign. First, because of everything that was previously said. Uh, we had panel discussions, we had our debates about rule of law, but I think that the main takeaway from all of this is rule of law is important. Uh, and it's important for our communities, it's important for society in general. So it's something that we need to tackle. Second, um, because something that Michael uh, said, and Therese as well, um, youth is important, young people. And I don't just say this because I want to feel empowered in a room full of older and more experienced people. Um, but yes, the youth is the driving force of society, precisely as, as Michael said. So that's the second, the second reason why we developed the, the, the role campaign uh, starting two years ago. And the third one is our vision, our purpose. Uh, that's in the, the slide. So one of the reasons ELSA exists is precisely to contribute to our societies, to make our communities better. And that's what we try to do with the role campaign by educating um, high schoolers, uh, younger, our youngest generations wh when it comes to role of law, active citizenship, and all of what is related to that. So. Roll appeared. Roll appeared two years ago as a joint effort between uh, ELSA and ELSA alumni with Thres, uh, Thres, uh in front of the project. Um, and basically, what is its purpose? Its purpose is to educate younger people, uh, younger people about rule of law, uh, about active citizenship, uh, their rights, how to protect themselves, how to engage in active citizenship. Um, and the idea is to go where high schoolers are, high schools, uh, and to go there and to teach them how to, in an engaging, interactive way, because, again, young people, and they need to have more engaging um, courses, uh, teach them precisely how to do it uh, in a comprehensive way. And that was the purpose. And it's structured, basically, three phases. We have the, um, the curriculum, creating the curriculum, creating the lessons, uh, where, again, Therese is helping, uh, helping a lot on that. Um, and then the localization. Um, the curriculum is m meant to be general, so that it can be adapted to each national country, uh, to each national group and of ELSA and each, in each country, to implement it according to their own specific circumstances. And so that's the first phase, that's where we are. Uh, and, and we are still defining, um, defining the curriculum, finishing it, and localizing national support. The second phase is training the, the teachers, training the volunteers that will go directly to the schools and talk to, talk to high schoolers and provide them the necessary information that's in the, in the curriculum. And the last one is, so we have the curriculum, we have the localization, we have the teachers. The third phase is implementing it, is actually doing the, the project and interacting with, with everyone involved. So that's the role campaign uh, in a nutshell, uh, in a very concise way. Um, and where are we right now? We're finalizing the curriculum, finalizing the, the general program. And with, with Elsa alumni, with the help of Theresa, we've been working a lot on trying to find national support. Um, right now we have eight pilot countries in the network and we are trying to start to implementing, implementing it slowly but steadily. Um, 
and ensuring that we also have more com countries coming in and ensuring that this program is sustainable and that we actually bring some change to society. That's, again, what ELSA is also meant to be. So that was my presentation, very short and simple. Uh, and if you have any questions, just ask and <laughs> I'll help out in any way I can. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for your insight. Um, I'm from Portugal, uh, and I have two questions, one to Francisco and another one to um, Michael. Uh, I will start by the easiest one. Uh, Francisco, could you please tell me why the targets uh, for role are only uh, schools? Are you thinking about local communities also in Asian and African countries? And Michael, why do you think that implementing legal empowerment, empowerment is so difficult because you have lack of uh, volunteers or even local partners to help you with? Thank you. Hello, hello, excellent. There are many, many, many issues with this sort of activity. I think that one of the difficult bits is not having a specific call to action. I've heard this great session from you. I know more about law now. I'm relatively inspired to think that human rights make a difference and that the rule of law holds society together. What do I do now? And, and, and that, that is a challenge that political participation maybe doesn't have. You can speak to a room of 16-year-olds and say, well, in many countries, it's time for you to register to vote. Do that now, and you have an immediate outcome. With the law, it's much more nebulous and much more difficult to have a concrete thing that's going to be the next step on that person's level of engagement. I also think that there's something about the infrastructure as well. No matter how old you are, no matter who you are, you do have some means by which you can speak your view about public policy and, and hope it is heard in the democracy space. In the law space, you could potentially write a blog into oblivion about how a particular thing needs to be changed, but where does it go? Politicians aren't necessarily going to be able to look through the deluge of people's potential views and say, that's a new piece of legislation, let's change the legal culture, let's start thinking about the judiciary, which links to the third issue, which is there are not as many people talking about the things that we are interested in as there are in climate change, as there are in democracy, etc. And we don't have a cadre of journalists who think specifically about the rule of law in all of our countries all of the time, unlike we do for issues like policing and environment. So I think the fact that so few people think no rights reflect upon the law is one of the reasons that there isn't much of an infrastructure for people to have concrete things to do after they learn about it. So we have to try and make those one of the things that I've been doing in some of my work is providing students an opportunity to do a, a, a little law reform competition of sorts where they're then able to say, this is a particular thing I'd like to change, and then they can send it to an MP or a member of parliament in our legislature, for example. So it's about having those inventive asks or calls to action after the activity that can translate it from one very interesting session at a random point to something that I'm going to follow as a programme of activity for the rest of my life, even if I don't become a lawyer. So that infrastructure and the steps from the first intervention are some of the real difficulties. Sorry to interrupt, just, I just want to add something. The reason uh, why I'm doing these questions is because of our Portuguese history, we have some law firms in Portugal that have, uh, they operate in African countries and all of them have projects to legal empowerment. That's why I was asking this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. 
So now about the, um, the second question, uh, the second and third. Uh, why European um, countries and not other, other continents? Well, it's the first step. Uh, and as a European-based association, uh, again, 44 countries, we have easy access to schools uh, in our countries. So it's not to say that, again, our vision, just world, yes, uh, but we need to start somewhere. And starting off with European countries where we have access, that's the way to go right now. The second question about why not local communities in general. Um, Again, Michael touched on it, I also touched a bit on it, which is youth, young people, are the driving force of society. Uh, of course, in 40 years, who will be here? We all hope, us, um, but potentially the younger people. Uh, younger people will be here as well. So it, our main target is those people, making sure that whoever comes next is equipped and has the knowledge on rule of law and how to have acti uh, participate actively in society. So in that sense, um, that's our target, that's our goal, is to educate young people. My body language was saying it's time to finish. Not because it's not interesting, it's exactly really at the heart of what we've been doing, but it's because we've got one last session and uh, I think we can stay until quarter to six, but that will be the end. So um, if I could invite our last panel of speakers up onto the stage, uh, we will uh, have our final session of the day. Sinisha, if you, if you, if you would, if Sinisha, if you would like to come and sit uh, up here, Christina also. Um, shall I play the Michael Flaherty's video and then you speak? Our third speaker. Would you prefer to speak first? Yeah. No, no. You, okay, you go first. Okay. So the order will be that uh, uh, our first speaker is uh, Christine Pessendorfer, head of the European International Rights Department in the Human Rights Department at the Federal Chancellery of Austria. And we're very grateful that she's made the time to come uh, and speak to us. The topic for this final session is national traditions of the rule of law. And what we're trying to tease out here is this question of what does the rule of law mean? And the project is to make all of you rich experts intellectually rich experts on the rule of law so that you can go out and take part in role and we can start engaging with our fellow citizens through schools uh, and support actively the rule of law. Um, then uh, when Christine uh, finishes, if we could have the, the video from uh, Michael Flati and then some final words from uh, Judge uh, Professor Sinisha Rona. So Christine, please. Thank you very much for the nice introdu introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear ELSA alumni, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to speak here today. Um, uh, I was already introduced. I'm legal advisor the Constitution and on constitutional and European law in the uh, constitutional service of the Federal Chancellery. And I was for uh, two decades the head of the European Court of Justice litigation team. More recently, my responsibilities have shifted to general questions of union law, international law, and human rights. Um, the subject of my presentation is to describe the legal evolution of a common European concept of the rule of law by way of standard setting of different European actors. So I'm very sorry to bore you with legal considerations at this late hour uh, after so many very interesting contributions on the value of the rule of law in the global and societal context. But to come to the rule of law, it's a historically 
a well-established and frequently applied constitutional principle in Anglo-American law, but its meaning and value um, is anything but clear and undisputed. It is even more difficult to find consensus on a pan-European concept of the rule of law. The different concepts and definitions of the rule of law, Rechtsstaat, Etat de droit, Etat, Estado de derecho, are based on very different historical roots and systems of law and the state. In some countries, there is a more formal understanding, characterized by the elements of legality and legal certainty, whereas in some others, more emphasis is placed on substantive elements, such as the protection of fundamental rights. For example, the corresponding Rechtsstaatsprinzip in the Austrian constitutional law has a stronger formal meaning. The Austrian constitutional court held that the Austrian Rechtsstaatsprinzip essentially means that all acts by the state must be based on laws and ultimately on the constitution, and that there is a system of judicial protect protection in place, ensuring that only such acts remain in existence that fulfill these requirements. Moreover, the Austrian constitution also guarantees fundamental rights, including those of the European Convention of Human Rights, which adds a substantive dimension to the Austrian understanding of the rule of law. The European Union presupposes a common understanding of the rule of law in its member states. We heard about the values of Article 2 TEU before. The values of Article 2 were implied from the start of the integration process, assuming that it was only open to democratic European states adhering to the rule of law and human rights protection. So the acceptance of the rule of law is one of the preconditions for accession to the Union. These values found more detailed expression in the articulation in 1993 of what is known as a Copenhagen criteria for accession, which aimed at the export of the hitherto unwritten principles now at the core of Article 2 to the candidate countries of Central and Eastern Europe. There was an ongoing treaty codification of these then unwritten uh, principles, starting with Article F, Para 1, Treaty of Maastricht, and the Treaty of Am Amsterdam, which included a reference to the rule of law and human rights in Article 6, Para 1, TEU, and this was completed by the Treaty of Lisbon. The values were closely linked to the sanctions clause in Article 7 TEU, since it was a breach of those values that would trigger the sanction process. The values are further reflected in the preamble of the treaty. The evolution of the rule of law in Europe is embedded in the Council of Europe, whose work is inconceivable for the development of a common approach to the rule of law. Article 2 TEU mirrors the preamble of the Council of Europe and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice is driven by a symmetry of values. We heard, about, we heard already about uh, the particular work of the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe that made an important attempt to reconcile the different concepts and definitions of the rule of law in Europe in its 2011 report on the rule of law. Against the background that the rule of law, along with democracy and human rights, makes up the three pillars of the Council of Europe, the Venice Commission tried to find a consensual definition together with an identification of the core elements of the rule of law in Europe. The 2011 report was updated and elaborated in detail by the 2016 checklist of the Venice Commission for evaluating the state of the rule of law in single states. So the Venice Commission has thus made an important contribution to the definition of a common standard of the rule of law in Europe. Building on the work of the Venice Commission, the European Commission has also defined the legal conditions for the practical application of the rule of law by laying down specific criteria for the application of the rule of law. According to the European Commission, the rule of law is essential for the functioning of the EU and for citizens and businesses to trust in public institutions. 
While member states have different legal systems and traditions, the core meaning of the rule of law would be the same across the Union. In its finding, the Commission is clearly inspired by the checklist of the Venice Commission. It can also draw on the case law by the European Court of Justice, which has on various occasions invoked Article 2 in its case law, most famously with regard to the independence of the judiciary in Poland. Now I want to come back to the initial, initial question and the subject. Uh, of the panel, National Traditions, Conflict or Consensus. It has been mentioned already that Article 2 is something like the DNA of the European Union. However, there is room for national constitutional specificities and national diversity in the European treaties. Article 2 has to be seen in context, embedded in a number of other constitutional provisions of EU law as well as provisions of the Council of Europe, which have to be seen in consistent interpretation. According to Article 4, Paragraph 2, the EU, the Union shall respect the national identities of the member states inherent in their fundamental structures, political and constitutional. With respect to the fundamental rights, Article 6, para 3, TEU refers to the European Court of Human Rights and the con constitutional traditions common to the member states um, that constitute general principles of the Union's law. In addition, almost all member states have identified integrationsschranken, constitutional limits of their, for their integration, either in their provisions on accession or in their case law. And the European Court of Justice has incorporated many constitutional traditions in its case law. However, there are limits to disintegration in the legal order of the Union when it comes to the fundamental values of Article 2. The breach of these values can be sanctioned by infringement proceedings and ultimately by the Article 7 sanctions process. It has been, uh, we heard already, uh, it has to be added that Article 4, Para 3, TEU imposes a duty of sincere cooperation, both on the Union and the, the Member States. We heard about it already. This duty requires a duty to uphold a dialogue between courts and in particular between constitutional and supreme courts and the European Court of Justice. Let me conclude. Respect for the rule of law is especially important within the European Union for the functioning of the Union, for the equality of its member states, and for citizens and businesses to trust in public institutions. Upholding the rule of law within the legal regimes of the member states was a precondition for their accession to the European Union, and Article 2 now sets a common standard that is binding for all member states of the European Union. The question of applying throughout the Union a common understanding of the rule of law as one of the fundamental values of the European Union is, however, not only a legal issue, but also a political one. In addition, implementing and complying with the rule of law is not a static task, but an ongoing task, even in well-established democracies. The Venice Commission assumes that the rule of law is a movable system of individual elements in which a robust political and legal culture plays an essential role. It is the citizens, the public officials, and the independent and impartial courts, and ultimately the Supreme Courts in the member states, who have a crucial role to play. The judicial protection systems of the European Supreme Courts and their procedural instruments provide them with the tools they need to do so. Most notably, these are the preliminary ruling procedure before the European Court of Justice and individual complaints before the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you for your attention. Uh, could we have the video of Professor O'Flaherty? And also, we've got an update uh, on top of our sponsors board, if we could lose that. Thanks. Hello. 
Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the conference. And I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be with you in person. And indeed, thank you uh, for accepting that I would deliver a short video message. Let me at the outset congratulate Elsa for this anniversary. I graduated in law too many years ago to have been able to be a member of ELSA, but I've seen the association uh, in its growth. I've seen it in its impact. For instance, I was deeply impressed by the role of ELSA in, just to take one example, the negotiation of the International Criminal Court. But let me turn now to the topic of this panel. My short presentation is about three, two, one. Three myths two challenges and one pledge. First, the myths. My first myth is the myth that somehow the rule of law concept lacks core content. When that claim is made these days, that's a political statement. It's not a legal one. It's clear that there is core content derived from treaties, from the human rights treaties, from the treaties of the European Union, from judgments of the European Court of Justice, European Court of Human Rights, from agreed political declarations at the highest levels of the United Nations, the Council of Europe and the EU. So let's do away with that myth. Stop allowing it interfere with our discourse. The second myth is that somehow this agreed content requires a homogenization of our national legal systems, that somehow it demands some kind of one size fits all, an imposition of alien institutions and legal cultures in societies where it's, it is said they do not fit well or appropriately. This too is nonsense. A, a healthy investment in engagement with commitment to the rule of law is about honoring the wonderful diversity of our legal systems. Across our countries, uh, distinctive uh, national law and tradition has evolved in response to the specificities uh, of the local situation. This should be valued, by no means done away with, but rather within that diversity, uh, we, 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 we ensure that the core principles of rule of law are given full and proper reflection. And by the way, to achieve that, uh, we can benefit so much from learning, from listening to each other through exchange of practice, including across the EU member states. And then the third myth. The third myth has to do with this sense that you can make a rule of law assessment at, within a country by just looking at the narrow specificity of an instrument, uh, of a law, or the narrow existence, functioning and mandate of a single institution, such as one particular court. It, it can't work like that. A, a, a proper assessment of the health of rule of law in any single society requires a looking at the, the entirety. The, the, the all elements of that society in terms of how strong and how deep is the commitment to rule of law, to democracy, to human rights, to values. And it's only when we frame the narrow law in this bigger context that we can draw the right conclusion. And so then, what are the two challenges? Well, let me take as my first challenge the challenge deriving from my last myth. And that is about how we as part of our rule of law engagement, how we contribute to the building up of the culture uh, of respect for human rights, investment in democracy, um, uh, honoring of values across our different countries. It's complex. It requires the work not only of lawyers, but also of all others who care about thriving, fair and equal societies. And then the second of my challenges uh, has to do with the periphery. I've spoken about core content of rule of law, where there's no dispute. Uh, but there are undoubtedly issues around the frame, around the margins uh, of rule of law, where it's not so clear whether they fit or they don't fit. And today, let me make one pitch, which is that as we dispute or as we argue what belongs in the rule of law definition that maybe has not historically been uh, perceived as being at the core, my pitch is for civil society. Uh, let's recognize the integral foundational role of civil society uh, for the health of our societies and so come to recognize that its welfare is also a dimension uh, of the rule of law assessment. And finally, friends, my pledge. 
My pledge is that the Fundamental Rights Agency, already heavily invested in these issues, will continue to do so. But we want to do it with you. We want to find ways to better deepen our cooperation, not just with lawyers, but specifically with young lawyers. You're about the future for sure, but you're also about now, with your vision, your insights, your, your, your perceptions, and your drive. And so it's in that spirit that I wish all of you very well for the continuation of this conference and for the next generation in the life of ELSA. Thank you. Well, that was very encouraging. Uh, Sinisha, would you offer us some concluding remarks? remarks, but uh, I'll, I'll share with you some of my thoughts that I have dropped out earlier or that occurred to me after I, I closed my, my, my original uh, presentation. Well, you, you would remember uh, that uh, the rule of law as a matter of EU law is enshrined in Article 2. And that Article 2, I said, it's, it's both normative and, and, and descriptive. You know, it says that, that the rule of law, among other values, is, is common to all member states. This means uh, that it is a concept of EU law. And for lawyers, as we have just heard, uh, w once you deal with such a concept, it, it, it does have contents and it has to be uh, precise. So, so, so uh, I, I completely agree with, with uh, what we've heard a minute ago, that uh, it simply doesn't stand that uh, the rule of law is, is broad enough to, to not, not to have uh, any, any meaningful content. That's simply not true. Well, the, 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 second, the, the, the second note that I have at this stage uh, is that the current can we call it crisis of the rule of law in the European Union and, and worldwide, is not because we have different national or any other traditions. That's simply not true. We may have different national and other traditions, and they still may fit within the narrative of, of, of the rule of law. The current crisis with the rule of law emerged because of general, across the board, complete negation of the tradition of liberal constitutionalism in which the rule of law is embedded. So we are not talking about differences within a tradition of, of liberal constitutionalism. We are talking about challenges to liberal constitutionalism as such, and altogether within that context with the rule of law. Now, I will come up with, with a short story, and that will be my, 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 my final part for, for, for today. You can find uh, the, the summary of, of, of what I'm going to say in, in, in the text again. But it is about the bounty, HMS bounty. You've all heard about the famous mutiny on, 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 on Bounty, where Fletcher Christian just kicked out Captain William Bly and, and, and his followers and took control of the ship, you know, picked up some, some, some women from, from Haitian islands, and then they, they moored the ship and burned the ship on, on one of uninhabited islands far away, uh, where they thought they will be out of reach of... of, of British sovereign power, and they were right for almost 200 years. 200 years later, the British Expeditionary Force discovers or rediscovers the Pitcairn Island, and what they find there, they, they find ancestors, or, or sorry, 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 not the ancestors, but, but progeny of, of a Fletcher Christian and his crew and, 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 and the, the Haitian women who live in a completely different culture, culture that is void of, of any considerations of, of, of well, well, or imagination of, 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 British, of British citizens. Essentially, they lived 
in incestuous relationships. Uh, rape of children was, was a rule rather than an exception. So, so the, the, their moral standards were scandalous for, for not just the times when it happened, you know, but for standards of, of today as, as, as well. So what British authorities decide to do, they decide to put the main perpetrators on trial. And, and, and well, well, they seized the, the, the Admiralty Court, who, who was competent to, to, to hear the case. And this case is relatively well documented and as it was followed by, by, by journalists at, at all times. And there is a book about this trial. It is called The Paradise Lost. It, it was written by a journalist who was, who was writing, who, who was following uh, the case. So the judge, in all his wisdom, was prepared to grant a very lenient sentence to those accused, provided they repent, provided they admit their, their wrongdoings and promise not to repeat them again which they refused, which they refused because they couldn't see what was wrong with their behavior. Their behavior was perfectly normal to them. It was part of their local culture that was considered completely outrageous to, 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 to people of, of, of Britain and the rest of the world, so to say. So, what does this tell us? This tells us that, well, accepting all the differences in comprehension within a certain culture, including of the concept of the rule of law, we have to be aware that there are traditions and cultures that are completely different, that they couldn't care less about the rule of law, or that their comprehension of the rule of law is so different from the, the one that we entertain that it cannot be reconciled. And that's the main challenge, I would say, to, to reach out, to understand how these differences could be overcome, at least within the European Union. At least within the European Union. And with this thought, I, 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 I will leave you and, and, and well, hope in the hope that... that we will be up to the task and that you know, the liberal democratic concept of the rule of law can still be cultivated and that it can still prevail. Thank you very much. So, I'm not going to allow questions because the clock is ticking, but you can ask questions uh, this evening and over the course of the weekend. There's not much time for thank yous either, but um, I'd like to thank the organizing committee who've worked so hard to pull this conference together. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Aero and Jonathan for their work in pulling together the book that very much represents the work of the uh, of the conference and features some of our keynote speakers. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Eva Skeris and her colleagues at GPK for being our organizers and our hosts here. Thank you very much. And lastly, all of us who've worked on this conference know how hard Johanna Kalpanen has worked. Um, so let's thank them all. And because I'm very scared of Johanna, I will hand over the last word to her. Uh, friends, I have three things, and this concludes the streaming, please. Uh, three things. First of all, those who are continuing the weekend, Marriott has an envelope with your badges, with your name. Those not staying at Marriott, come to me and you get this one. Um, there is sp Some of the sponsors and speakers are waited at Palais Epstein. I would like you to first go and take your garderobe and things like that. Uh, it's line three, uh, no, line one, tram to Schottentor Universität. Uh, no, line one to Ring Volkstheater. That's the Palais Epstein people, please. And then all of us, uh, we are welcome at the, at the Mensa of the university at the, um, at the uh, Wirtschaftsuniversität. If you have not signed up, no worries, there is space. Price is 40 euro, you pay cash on site. And how to get there, it's next to the Marriott. Again, 
this is now line one to Schottentor, and then you change to U2 to Kriau. Thank you very much. Exactly. It's the Economical University, which is next to the Messe, so the Wirtschaftsuniversität, not the traditional old one. Thank you.